Good morning, everyone. Morning, welcome. Morning. My name is Mike Marshall. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, preaching this morning on behalf of Reverend Lance Marshall, our senior pastor and my pretend nephew. Uh, he is, he's relaxing today, as all of us look forward to doing. So he is getting a well-deserved day off in advance of Thanksgiving, and we are thrilled uh, to be part of the worship team this morning. And it's a wonderful team, a, a team that includes Cindy Moon and uh, Reverend Phyllis and Reverend Brenda, who, by the way, is preaching today in her home church in Dallas, which is very, very exciting, I think. Uh, so grateful for the gathering band and for the music that we always enjoy uh, this morning for, for Clint and Taylor and Tim. Uh, they may be small, but they are scrappy <laughs> and excellent. And so, so thankful. You know, Lance does such a good job of this every Sunday. Um, you know, think of all the people that serve on a Sunday morning. There's Brian Richmond back back there at the camera. There are so many others who are uh, up on the third floor in our AV team. There's our, our greeters and ushers. There are those who uh, are, gosh, they're with our children on the second floor. They're with our youth across the building in the Justin building. And so, as uh, Phyllis said earlier, you used the word, I'm proud to see you here this morning. And I share that pride. Thank you for, for those of you who are here in the sanctuary, for those of you who are worshiping online. Some of you are right here in Fort Worth and in the Metroplex. Some of you are in a home together. Uh, you are our beloved United Methodist community in Cisco, and we say good morning to you and good morning to others who may even be worshiping beyond that. It is just so good to be together today because this is one of those, this is one of those best days. I mean, this is a, a springboard day into gosh, into festiveness and, and banquets and parties and meals. You know, we're leading into to Thanksgiving. We begin the season of Advent. We have all that's wonderful with Christmas. And this is just such a neat time to be together. And at least for me, it's tempting sometimes to believe that this is the only time of the year that I overindulge. However, honesty somehow finds a way of getting right up into your face. For example, a week ago, my wife and I were in Fredericksburg, and we were in a store, and we saw a sign that looked something like this. <laughs> Don't blame the holidays. You were fat in August. This is a moment of self-realization for me. I can't speak for any of you. But, you know, this is such a, it's such a wonderful time of year. And, and today, it is a transition because we're completing the, uh, the sermon series that Lance started about six weeks ago. It's called Crossroads. And as you know, uh, we've been using stories and characters in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Bible, and using them as a way for us to connect with the crossroads that they met and then also the crossroads that we meet in our lives, the challenges where we have to say, I can do this, I can do this. What am I going to do with God's help? And so this morning we're using a reading, the reading that Cindy did from uh, the book of Esther. We're really, in essence, we're using the entire book of Esther because it's, it's just this really neat, it's on one hand, it, there, there are parties and banquets that never seem to end in the book. And then on the other hand, it's the story of a very courageous person. In fact, more than one person. The crossroads that they faced. And then there's even a historical element to it. Because by the time you get to the end of the book of Esther, for devout Jews, 
This is now an explanation of what is the festival of Purim, P-U-R-I-M. It's a festival that happens, well, next year it's going to begin on March 6th, and it happens about a month before Passover, and it's a celebration of being freed and a celebration of being God's people. And so all this takes place in the book of Esther, and within those stories and those characters, I think there's an important truth that I would always like to remind myself of, and and I want to throw it out here thanks to our uh, AV team, that really is something that we can, and that one is one that we will enjoy later on. If there is, if there is the quotation that begins with the phrase, our relationships, do we have that? Well, tell you what. I will, re- I will read that to you, and I will do it proudly. And who knows, magically we may see it at some point. Here's the statement from Esther. Our relationships influence and often change our beliefs about the world and the people who live in it. So think about that for a moment. What we believe, how we act out the, those beliefs, I think very often is a result of our relationships, those we know, those we love, those who teach us. Now, I think the simplest introduction to the book of Esther is one that comes from one of the children's story Bibles up on the second floor. Uh, This is the Spark Story Bible, and listen to this paragraph. Once, there was a young girl named Esther. Her cousin Mordecai worked for the king. When Esther's parents died, she went to live with her cousin in the palace. Esther learned new things, wore dazzling clothes, and grew into a beautiful young woman. When the king saw Esther, he said, I am so happy. I want you to wear this crown and be my queen. It's a beautiful introduction, one that we can understand at all ages. It it does leave out some things. For example, in the first chapter of Esther, in the midst of one of those, literally a week-long banquet, where the king and all of his friends were quote-unquote merry with wine, The current queen, Queen Vashti, is called by the king to come, I think, in essence, to parade herself in front of the king. She simply says, thank you, but no thank you. And because of that really amazingly strong statement, she is ushered off stage left. And then we learn a bit more about how Esther and her cousin Mordecai come into the story. Esther and Mordecai are both Jews, and it's not really well known that they are, because the Jews at that time, those who lived in Persia and other places, about 500 years before the time of Jesus, they often faced persecution. And so it wasn't often common knowledge if you were a Jew. Well, in chapter 3, right before what Cindy read to us this morning. We discover, I mean, chapter 3 is a horrible chapter. And there are places in Esther where there is a lot of violence that often is common in the Old Testament. But chapter 3 is horrible because there is a man named Haman. Haman works for the king, as does Mordecai. And Haman has been promoted And his promotion technically says that everyone should bow to him whenever he walks by. And his big old ego says, I really like this. Well, everyone did that, except for Mordecai. Mordecai couldn't bow to Haman. He probably wouldn't bow to anyone other than God. And Haman is furious. He has a crossroads moment where he can just put that aside and move on, but he doesn't do it. In fact, 
he multiplies it to the degree that he vows to not only kill Mordecai, but every Jew who's living in Persia. And knowing that the king is not the strongest leader in the world, he's not the strongest swimmer in this story. Knowing that, Haman comes up with a plan where he says to the king, there is a certain people, he won't even name the Jews, but he says, there's a certain people who they, they won't follow your laws, they are a problem for your empire, I suggest that they are eliminated. And to make it worth your while, I, Haman, will make a huge contribution to your treasury for you to do that. Haman bribes the king. The king accepts the bribe, doesn't even ask who those, that certain people is. And the decree is sent out that all Jews in the kingdom should be killed. So chapter 4 happens. Mordecai is mourning in, the, uh, in the, the style of that day, wearing sackcloth and ashes, and other Jews around the kingdom are as well. And Esther, who has been chosen queen and is this lovely personality who, because she's in the castle, kind of in her own quarters, she's kind of separated from what's going on. She learns that, that Mordecai is so upset. She initially simply wants to give him clothes to put on, and he refuses, so she sends one of her servants, and, and from that, we have later on, beginning in, in the second part of chapter 4, and then going through about the end of chapter 7, we have a series of crossroads moments. One of the people that has a moment like that is Mordecai. Because Mordecai effectively uses his relationship with his younger cousin, Esther, to say to her, I think God has put you in this place. In fact, in this beautiful verse, uh, verse 14 in chapter 4, he says something like this. He says, he says, Perhaps, perhaps you were chosen for this royal dignity for just such a time as this. It's an incredible phrase. And so he rises to the, the occasion to encourage Esther. And like anyone, Esther is scared. And initially, she doesn't want to do it. But in her crossroads moment, she puts aside her fear. She draws upon her faith. And she comes up with the most courageous and creative plan you have ever seen. If you read the book of Esther, I predict that once you start down this saga, you won't be able to put it down. You'll just keep reading and reading. Because the way that Esther, through a series of of banquets, because those Persians love banquets in this book, through a series of banquets, eventually, Esther is able to say to the king, you know, that certain people that, that you heard about, they are the Jews. I am a Jew. I am your queen, and I am a Jew. And the real, the real villain in this story is the evil Haman. Now the last person who has a crossroads moment is the king himself. The king who is underachieved through this whole story. He finally rises to the occasion. And because of his love for Esther, because of his relationship with her, he believes her. He accepts her counsel and what she says. And then in a very ironic twist of fate, as he is promoting Mordecai into Haman's position, he's also ordering that Haman be hung from the gallows that he himself, Haman, had arrogantly ordered to be built 
for the death of Mordecai. So many different crossroads moments in this story. So again, I remind you of that phrase that I read to you a moment ago. The phrase that says, our relationships influence and often change our beliefs about the world and the people who live in it. That certainly was the case in the book of Esther. Now, as a pastor, I, I cherish relationships. I, I just love the, the, the staff members and the people that, that I am able to work with. And, and gosh, to do justice to all the people that I cherish here, so many of you and so many others, it would take about a two and a half hour sermon to really do justice to this. I don't think that's what you were looking for when you came here. Although it is true that for most associate pastors, we've been saving up material for months now, and it's like, all right, let's go! But not today. Phyllis wouldn't do it, and so I'm gonna follow her lead and not do it either. But I do want to tell you about another of our associate pastors that in addition to my respect for Phyllis, for Brenda, for, for everyone, there's Reverend Tom McDermott. Reverend Tom McDermott leads the 1111 uh, worshiping community. Uh, they meet in the historic 512 building across our east parking lot. Tom is a gifted musician, storyteller, writer, uh, it's amazing the things that he is good at. And at the end of just about every week, Tom sends out an email to the 1111 community, and I look forward to that. And this week's reflection did not disappoint. And I mean this. If you don't receive that 1111 email every week, please contact me and I will forward this to you. And I will make sure that you have an opportunity to be a part of this. Tom is talking about the world through the eyes of giving thanks, which is perfect for this week. And he says this. He says, we see things differently. That's the truth of it. To some, fall is a welcome season of change. And to others, it's a time of darkness and the world dying. To one person, a photograph on the wall is just about objects or things. But to the photographer, it's an expression of the blending of the past and the present and the future. We sing, see things differently, and the way we see the world determines how we live. Our vision often has much to do with the kind of relationships that we seek and enjoy. We may see certain people, there's that phrase again, certain people as just plain wrong or worse as enemies for whatever reason. And because of this sight, we may miss the redemptive possibilities of this certain people ever becoming friends or even better, teachers of something we need to understand. And then here's how he ends his reflection. He says, can you remember a time when your breath was taken away and you realize that, that what it means to be fully loved and to be loved by others is so important? Where you felt so deeply loved by life itself that you just had to tell someone. So I cherish words like that from Tom McDermott. I also cherish people who have been members of our church, and one of those um, is a dear man who is now dead. Uh, his name is Jim Wright, the Honorable Jim Wright, who served for 35 years in Congress, who then retired and uh, came back to Fort Worth and came back to our church. And truly, I could, I could take two and a half hours talking about Jim Wright with you, and truly I won't. Uh, but I will say a couple things. One is that uh, this Tuesday, it will be 59 years since the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. You may know that he and his wife Jackie spent their last night in Fort Worth at the Hotel Texas. 
Um, and then he spoke in an impromptu speech to people out in the rain, and then he did a Chamber of Commerce breakfast, and then they got on the plane to go to Love Field. Well, today, if you walk in downtown by the convention center, and if you're over by the entrance to that hotel, the downtown Hilton, uh, there is the beautiful memorial wall, the JFK Memorial Wall. And if you look to the left-hand panel of that wall, you do see this. And I don't put this up as if I want you to be able to read every word, because I can barely read it from right here but I put it up as a symbol of the kind of tenderness that he writes about on that panel about his friend and his president, John F. Kennedy. Those words are based on relationship, and those relationships were a part of what Jim Wright brought back to Fort Worth. Um, he and his family would sit right over here and they would worship together. He was the lay reader on my first Sunday in this church when he did Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 from the King James Version with no Bible. He just did it by memory. And I simply sat there and said, oh my goodness. And then I'll always remember that, that maybe about 10 years ago, Dr. Brewster invited Jim to join our staff for a luncheon in Wesley Hall. And in that luncheon, he told stories about what it was like to be in Washington in those days. And he contrasted that to the current climate. And he was talking about the current climate 10 years ago, let alone today. And he said this. He said, in those days, most legislators lived in D.C. the whole year, and their families lived there. So we knew each other. Our children went to school together. They played together. We, you know, we lived in the same neighborhoods. And he said, he said, yes, we, we had disagreements. And on the, the, the floor of the House or of the Senate, we would debate and we would disagree, but we would never disrespect one another. Because that night, we were together. We were having dinner together. Our families were together. Jim Wright talked about relationships. He didn't talk about policy with us. He talked about relationships. And that's what I offer to each one of you today. This is a wonderful Sunday, a Sunday that leads into so much that is good, a, sun, a Sunday that leads into the times of, of festiveness, and food, and overindulgence. And it leads into a time of relationships. May you see your relationships as a gift from God, and may they shape who you are and what you believe as a child of God. Let us pray. Oh God, we give you thanks for all the ways that you are with us. We give you thanks for your presence in Jesus Christ. We know, oh God, that he is the personification of your love and of your commitment to all the world. May we use his life and his leadership as a way for us to be faithful to do it in ways where we willingly accept your love and we eagerly offer it to others. And all these things we do in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who teaches us to pray together as we now say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.